This material is made available to you by or on behalf of the University of Melbourne under Section 113P of the Copyright Act 1968. It may be subject to copyright. For more information, visit the University Copyright website. So hello everyone and welcome to the Melbourne Veterans School Seminar Series. This is Brian hosting this seminar. I would like to welcome this week Dr. Bida Jones, who is joining us from slightly sunny Sydney today. Dr. Jones is the former director of RSPCA Australia and is currently an honorary associate with the Sydney School of Veterinary Science. Peter, thank you very much for accepting my invitation to present some of your work in this forum. It is sincerely appreciated. One of the aims of, of the Melbourne Veteran School Seminars is to have an active and vibrant forum for discussions of topics of veterinary and wider interest. And your contribution is in my view, one of the highlights of the series today, so thank you. For some in the audience that may not know the speaker, Dr. Jones is the former director of RSPC Australia, whose career with that organization spanned 25 years. Bida was recently appointed as a member of the Order of Australia for her services to animal welfare, science and advocacy. Her research interests focus on improving the welfare of animals in Australian society, from companion animals, animals in sport, native and introduced wild animals, to humane killing and slaughter. Bida is the regular panelist at the Robert Dixon Memorial Symposia and is co-developing an introductory OLE unit on understanding animal welfare. She has published over 35 reports, book chapters and peer-reviewed articles and has numerous uh, and has represented animal welfare interests on numerous national committees and as an invited speaker at multiple conferences, workshops, and symposia. The title of the presentation is Advancing the Interests of Animals, and it's a very topical talk too. Australians care about animal welfare and their level of concern is growing. But do our laws, regulations, and animal welfare standards live up to community expectations or much what contemporary science tells us about what animals need to experience in terms of good animal welfare? Dr. Jones has devoted her career to improving the lives of animals through using science to affect policy change. In this talk, she will reflect on her experiences as an animal advocate and consider what reforms are needed to ensure the interests of animals are heard and respected. There will be some time at the end for questions and discussion. This seminar will be recorded and I understand this will be the first of our seminars to be uploaded to our YouTube channel, thanks to Aaron. Again, thank you for accepting our invitation. And without further ado, over to you, Dida. Thanks so much, Panos. I will um, share my screen, hopefully, and you can see my slides. Um, I'm actually on Ngunnawal country, um, which is otherwise known as Canberra. Um, but I live on Walbanja country, which is near nearer to the coast in New South Wales. Um, and I'd like to pay my respects to um, the traditional owners of country and their um, elders past and present. Um, so I'm, I'm going to take you on a bit of a journey um, today. Um, you'll see there's two logos on this slide. Um, RSPCA Australia, where I worked for 25 years until the end of last year, and the Australian Alliance for Animals, which is a new organisation, um, I'm now involved with, which I will tell you a lot more about towards the end of, of this presentation. But um, yeah, a, a little journey. Um, I chose this photo which, where I do look rather determined. Um, <laughs> I did an interview with the ABC at the end of last year about battery cages, and, and I knew it was a bit of a setup when they sort of fiddled with the lighting and said, would you mind crossing your arms and looking serious? 
Um, so this was a photo that appeared in an ABC article, but I, I actually really like it because it it it's a little bit um, in it's a little bit representative of a lot of the positions that I've had to take over the years. Um, I've crossed my arms quite a few times. Um, so this journey will be um, yes, uh, just taking you through where I've my, my animal welfare career. Um, the uh, use of animal welfare science and advocacy in that and and why I think uh, we need a new approach to animal welfare policy making in Australia. Um, so you may or may not agree with some of the things I'm going to say. I'm very happy to, to talk about that in, in questions. This is very much a personal journey and a lot of personal opinion, um, particularly because I am I'm now don't represent the largest animal protection um, organisation in, in Australia in, in the RSPCA, so I'm off the leash, so to speak. <laughs> not that you'll find that that has really affected um, much of what I'd say because I've been pretty... Um, my views are, are very much an evidence-based approach to animal welfare. And it's great to see some familiar names in the audience here. So some of you will be quite familiar with my work. Some of you I've worked with for a long time and others um, less so. So um, I hope um, I, I managed to um, stretch across that audience. So yes, um, starting from the animal's point of view, I, I, I've chosen this because this is where I, you know, my original training um, started. So I'm a zoologist, not a vet. Um, I've had an honorary appointment with the vet school at Sydney for over 20 years now, but I'm very much come from a, a animal behaviour training. Um, and my PhD was on this amazingly cute species, the common marmoset. This marmoset is vocalizing very loudly, and that's what I studied. I studied the vocalizations of common marmosets and worked out how they use those vocalizations in their to communicate with each other and their social behavior. And that work took me, um, I was in a lab environment that took me into um, the animal houses of major pharmaceutical companies around the UK and overseas in the US. And, and, and a number of other countries where marmosets were used as a model, non-human primate model. And what I understood was uh, gradually that many of the people that worked with them knew nothing about marmosets at all. They didn't understand anything about their biology. Um, they were cared for well, uh, they had good nutrition, they were you know, reasonable housing, but no real understanding of what uh, made a marmoset tick. Um, and therefore very difficult to really understand what good welfare was for those for that species. And that's what began my interest in, in animal welfare. And I, I started working for the RSPCA in the UK, specifically on laboratory primate welfare. And I was there for three years before I moved to Australia. So I thought maybe I should very quickly touch on what animal welfare is because there's not necessarily a shared understanding of this um, and I think it's important that we we sort of are all on the same page um, from the very beginning. Um, animal welfare from from my point of view and this is very much the, the RSPCA's um, definition as well, um, it includes the physical and the mental states of an animal. It's, that's that's crucial. And anything which affects these states can affect an animal's welfare. So that could be good, that could be neutral, that could be bad. So we're already introducing the idea here of positive welfare and uh, negative welfare. And it's not static, it changes over time. Everything that happens to an animal can affect that state um, and its welfare can change uh, minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day, year by year. And there's a number of frameworks that are used within um, the animal welfare science field to, um, to, to look at welfare. Um, and from a veterinary point of view, uh, and often uh, the prevailing view in animal welfare science, particularly when I came to Australia in the 90s, the mid 90s, um, was that um, animal welfare was very much about biological functioning. So it was about the um, about animals being healthy, about being able to, to produce well, 
Um, and a lot of focus on the physiological indicators of animal welfare, like body condition and mortality and disease. My approach um, coming from an animal behavior point of view um, as an ethologist um, was very much that animal welfare was about how an animal uh, feels, what its emotional state was, and really looking at the behavioral indicators of, of animal welfare. And then there's a third uh, perspective, which is about natural living, which is where animal welfare is about um, animals being able to express natural behaviors. But in truth, animal welfare is about all three of these things. Um, that's the, 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 the essence of, of where we are now in, in terms of thinking about animal welfare. You can't ignore any of these different, um, these different perspectives, but animal welfare scientists will um, relate often to one um, or more of these concepts, um, depending on their training and their area of expertise. And that's had a significant influence, I think, on the way in which animal welfare has been considered in an Australian context, because the, the prevailing view has been um, that animal welfare is all about biological functioning, um, particularly in the agriculture farmed animal space. But in recent years, we've also understood um, that animal welfare is about providing positive experiences, thinking positively for animals as well as negative. So a lot of the previous, the, the, the traditional um, idea about animal welfare is about um, ensuring animals were, or, or attempting to ensure that animals were um, protected from harm, um, protected from pain, protected from, from suffering and distress. But that's not enough to give animals good welfare. We need to make sure that they have positive experiences and those include things like contentment and being able to be curious and um, play and make choices about the things that they spend their time doing. Um, so you have to, if you want to provide good welfare, you've got to make sure that animals are given the opportunities to engage in rewarding and positive behaviors. That's kind of the contemporary um, view of animal welfare, and that's changed a lot in the time that I've worked in this space. One of the, um, uh, and, and part of the, what's changed is a move from um, what was the prevailing model of animal welfare back in the 90s, which was the five freedoms. Again, that going back to what I just said in terms of, of uh, protecting animals from harm, very much a, uh, a model that is about um, that, that um, avoiding negative experiences rather than thinking about animal welfare in a positive way. So the preferred model now, um, and certainly I think this is a prevailing framework in the, in the Southern hemisphere at least, is, is David Meller's five freedoms model. And that allows you to consider all the different physical and functional factors that affect welfare. So an animal's behavior, its nutrition, the environment it's in, its health, and all of those things um, uh, have the effect that all of those different um, domains have on the affective or mental state of the animal, how it feels, what it's experiencing. And the massive advantage of the five domains model is it allows you to consider both positive and negative impact and not leave anything out. Some, any, anything that affects an animal can go into one of these different domains and can be considered when we're thinking about overall welfare. And that's the basis for building um, the evidence base around better understanding animal welfare that I've, I've taken throughout my work. Um, so the five domains, yeah, has had a, a massive influence on a lot of the work that I've done, um, and the, I've had the um, had the honour in 2020 of actually contributing to a paper with David Meller um, that um, expanded the five domains framework to include human animal interactions, and the, the link to that paper is is up there. And all of those um, I can provide later as well if if you miss any links. So moving on, um, well, that was just really a very potted history. And I, I know a lot of you were probably already oh, very familiar with what I've just talked about. But how do you use that science base, that evidence base to try and um, improve the welfare of animals in Australia? 
So working in the charity sector um, as a scientist, my role has been to use that background in animal behaviour and welfare science to try and, and, and implement changes and improve the welfare of animals in Australia. And I've been lucky enough to work across just about every area of animal welfare. I think yeah, in, in this presentation, I can't possibly talk about all of those. So I've focused on a few different examples. Um, and what I want to do now is just talk about how you use how, how you can use that evidence to try and um, build the basis for change. So one of those is uh, is the development of of good um, evidence based policy. Uh, and I chose uh, a picture here of sows in um, in sow stalls because I think um, if the RSPCA hadn't um, decided. Um, more than 20, 25 years ago, that uh, the evidence base um, was there to say that we should no longer be keeping sows in, in sow stores, that the, the behavioural deprivation of sow stores was so significant, and the evidence was there to, to, to show that. I think if the RSPC hadn't put that into a policy position, um, it would have taken a lot longer to get to where we are today, where we have an industry that has voluntarily um, phased out largely the use of sow stores in Australia. So that policy setting can be the trigger for um, significant change over time. Not always, but it's a it's a very good starting point. Another um, key way of using that evidence base to try and influence change is through educating the public um, and. One of the things that um, that the RSPCA has become very good at is um, is is in providing a consistent um, base of evidence to the public through a number of different means. And and the RSPCA knowledge base is probably my um, the pinup um, of all of those different um, ways that can be uh, that, that that science can be disseminated. Um, so the trigger for this was. Um, Listening, uh, I can give you a, a, a one example of when this really started. I was listening to um, a colleague on the phone talking about talking to a member of the public who had rung up to ask a question about dog behavior. And um, they got into a conversation talking about what the problem was with um, this particular person's dog. And I thought around Australia, um, within the RSPCA, there were but literally hundreds of people answering phones and thinking that they could provide the right answer to this question. And they were going to get a hundred different responses to that question. And it was really clear that we needed to be able to, at the at that very point of contact with the public, provide them with the best evidence, the, be the, the best advice we could based on evidence. And that's where we started putting together the RSPCA knowledge base. And this was in the time when people were really shifting from using um, phone calls as the primary means of um, asking questions um, and, and contacting an organization like the RSPCA to using the internet. And gradually over that time, um, the knowledge base has expanded. So it has answers to probably about 700 different animal welfare questions um, by now. Um, and all of those questions are, are, um, are, are built up over time um, from the, uh, the the huge amount of information that the RSPCA science and policy team, um, and I know there are some members of that team listening today. Um, thank you for everything that that um, you're still doing towards um, expanding this amazing source of knowledge. So um, that's really uh, a way of getting good information to the public. Um, and when people go to the knowledge base, they might be looking about uh, might be interested in one of the most popular questions, which is how to toilet train your puppy. At the same time, they can learn about a, a whole range of other um, issues, probably uh, things that they may not have thought of, um, from you know humane control of rodents to what's the RSPCA's view about mulesing. It's all there, so it's a it's a very good way of providing information, uh, freely available good information um, to the public. 
So the, uh, the third way um, of um, improving welfare through this um, building up of the evidence base in, in, is, this, is disseminating science and influencing the animal welfare debate. So the RSPCA is very has from oh, before my time. I'm thinking um, the Animal Welfare Scientific Seminar, or Animal Welfare Seminar, as it's now called, has been running for mm, probably 30 years, um, and it's a fantastic annual event that brings together um, people, contemporary experts on a, a topical issue. Um, the last two have been um, about the uh, the uh, humane domestic cat management in Australia in 21 and then earlier this year animal welfare and a change in climate so they're really good opportunities now especially because of um, the online environment anyone um, can join them um, so they've become very important um, dates in the calendar for the dissemination of animal welfare information and the Animal Welfare Science Update, which is a way of increasing the spread of academic papers outside of academia to um, practitioners, to policymakers, to people who um, either don't have access or don't have the time to access original scientific literature. But um, there it is, um, comes out every quarter. If you're not already subscribed to it, I thoroughly recommend that you are. And it's, I think these these the, the seminars um, and the update have um, really helped influence the direction of animal welfare science in Australia, um, really contributing to the debate about how we can best quantify and assess animal welfare as well. So the fourth way of um, um, of working um, to, to build on this evidence base is to work with government and industries to directly improve the way in which we treat animals in this country. I've put up three examples here, but I could have put up 20, 30, 40 um, throughout the, the team that I work with, so many different committees, um, standards writing groups, standards reference groups, all sorts of opportunities that have existed over the years to um, to improve standards um, either directly through participating in this in an industry process or a government process or um, for example with the best practice domestic cat management um, report um, that was very much about trying to push the debate forward um, by releasing a document that uh, reviewed um, the way you know the, the current literature and um, management practices throughout throughout Australia. So, um, and this is probably where I start to, to question how well these methods can actually work to change things. They're all really, really important, um, but sometimes you need something that's a little bit stronger than just putting information out there. Um, and particularly when you sit on committees and watch as the interests of animals are outweighed by economic factors and other interests, so that um, the end result of that process that you may have spent you know, hundreds of hours on is only very, very small change. Um, sometimes you need more motivational tools. So one of the approaches that um, took in in um, the last few years has been to uh, encourage um, state and territory governments, for example, to um, improve their regulation through comparative means. So this uh, scorecard approach um, has been applied um, thus far to the uh, regulation of animal welfare in abattoirs, poultry processes, and knackeries. Uh, you can also get see this on the, in, it's an interactive um, scorecard on the RSPCA website. So this is just showing the scorecard for abattoirs. There's, there's a separate one for each of the different categories of, of processing facilities. And this is a way of, of really encouraging states and territories to see where they sit and improve their standards by, by a comparative method. Um, and you'll see that I'm quite fond of the scorecard approach as we get closer to the end of this talk. Um, 
so it shows who the good performers are it shows what's possible and it shows who the worst performers are um, and it gives um, industry it gives gives the RSPCA a way of benchmarking um, the performance of a particular state and territory at a particular point in time um, so there's an opportunity then to revisit this year on year and see where regulatory changes have actually um, improved things so for example at the moment in in Queensland there's a review of the Animal Care and Protection Act they're looking at um, the potential for introducing um, CCTV in abattoirs um, that would improve their score in this scorecard next time around. So, um, so far what I've talked about is the, the constructive use of evidence to um, encourage change, but um, this alone isn't enough when it comes to some of the big problems that we're faced in, in terms of animal welfare issues in Australia. When it comes to animal industries in particular, large scale commercial animal industries, the forces of that commercial pressure mean that acting in the interests of animals is rarely the first priority. So in those sorts of situations, sitting on committees producing information isn't enough. In order to affect change, you need to advocate for it or uh, campaign for it, it's the same thing. I've been involved in a lot of different issue-based campaigns, but two of them have been ongoing since the very beginning of my, um, my work in, um, in Australia. So they're both also live issues at the moment, um, and they are keeping hens in battery cages and the live sheep export trade. So I'm not going to spend any time explaining to you why I think those two trades, that, that, sorry, those two issues are animal welfare problems. I'm going to assume that you already understand that they are. I'm assuming that you accept the overwhelming science that hens suffer in, ba in battery cages. Um, I'll point out that 36 countries have already banned them and that there are alternative systems in place. Um, and I won't explain in any detail why it is that slaughtering animals close to the point of production is um, the best alternative, the best solution um, for a problem like live export. Um, that sending them on a three-week journey to the Middle East is going to come out with a, a poorer welfare outcome. What I want to talk about is how um, how advocacy and, and campaigning to change has um, helped or or and what points, what are the trigger points that have helped um, improve welfare and or improve, um, try to reach these outcomes over time. So I'm just checking my time, see how I'm going. So banning battery cages, have we had any progress on this issue? So um, when I moved to Australia in 96, this was one of the issues that I started working on. Um, back in the day when RSPC Australia had two members of staff and I was working part-time. Um, I wrote a report on this issue, um, did a literature review of the current science at that point in time that showed um, the welfare issues associated with keeping hands in barren battery cages. Um, and that at that point, we were just heading into a process of um, reviewing um, the current standard. So before I moved, to Australia, there had been a review in 1994. Um, and by the time I got here, we were in a, a situation in Australia, we had 10.5 million hens in cages, 91% of the eggs that that were the whole eggs that were being uh, bought in supermarkets came from cages. But we had a majority of people in Australia that thought that that was unacceptable already at that point. So the level of awareness of the issue in the community was pretty high, majority of people opposing it. By the time we got to um, 2008, um, and I picked this time simply because I gave a talk at that point where I lo was looking at the progress over 10 years, um, by that point, 84% of people thought that battery cages were unacceptable. 84% of people, that's um, a about as big a majority as you'll get if you ask anybody, anyone in Australia about anything. Um, we had fewer, a, a, a higher proportion of um, eggs 
coming from non-cage systems, but we had more hens in cages by that stage, so 11.6 million hens in cages simply because the, the flock had increased in volume. Um, now in 2022, where are we up to? So a review of the poultry standards and guidelines started seven years ago. Um, that review is ongoing, seven years of looking at um, uh, one standard for animal welfare affecting one group of farmed animals. We have fewer hens in cages now, nine million hens in cages. Um, we have 40% of eggs only now coming from cages. So we've gone below that. That is now a, um, the minority of, of eggs, um, but still 9 million hens in, in cages. And we have maintained that level of opposition in terms of the, the community. 84% of people still think that keeping battery cages, uh, keeping hens in battery cages is unacceptable. I don't think that number is going to go down. So it's clear we have a majority of, um, of the community that think this should be phased out. And we have had since, um, since yeah, uh, for over 25 years in Australia had that, that position. So what's, um, what's holding things up? Um, so when this process started, this re the review of the standards and guidelines, um, did, was science considered in that question that was posed to the the uh, the committee that started to the, to consider these standards? Well, no, there was no phase out of battery cages proposed at that point in time. No scientific literature review was part of that um, that standards process, um, and there was no uh, costing for a phase out in the regulatory impact statement that was proposed. Um, when the standards were being drafted. So none of the things that um, we considered as being crucial in terms of what we knew about the evidence um, and more to the point, the community expectations, those were not being considered in the process that was developing those, those standards and guidelines, reviewing them. So, um, and there's a lot of information that um, sort of sits behind what I'm, I'm talking about here. A lot of uh, things that happened over the course of the last seven years. But what made things change in the process um, that meant that some of those things started to be considered? Well, the, the crucial thing that happened was media. So um, and if I've got one message to tell you about advocacy and animal welfare, it's you don't make anything happen unless you have the media involved and public discussion about the issue and um, a crucial step in terms of trying to get change is, is to start talking about it publicly. And that's what advocacy is really about. So in, in, um, uh, in 2017, um, after uh, a couple of very frustrating years, um, a story was um, published about the process behind why we didn't have um, battery cages on the table as part of the discussion of the changes in standards for layer hens. Um, and as a result, um, we did get some progress. So 2017, the Victorian government commissioned its own literature review. Um, up until then, the only one that was had been provided was one that the RSPCA, that, that, I, that my team at the time put together. Um, also a scientific review was published as a result of that. Um, so doing that background work again to try and influence the, the, the process, but that was very much um, that the uh, building the evidence base, but but the trigger was the media for the, and that issue around science to be taken really seriously by government. Um, also, as a result of significant campaigning by RSPCA and other groups, 160,000, 167,000 submissions were, um, were put into the public consultation on the standards and guidelines in 2018. That was the biggest ever um, number of public submissions to any animal welfare consultation process. And of course, the vast majority were asking for a phase out of battery cages. 
Um, and as a result, the post-consultation draft of the standards did include a phase-out option. So a significant shift um, because of the media exposure that was, um, and the fact that, which was really uncovering the influence of industry in the process itself. And that's, that has, that has been the, um, the reason why we haven't got that change. Of course, if we had an industry that supported the phase out of battery cages, it would have happened uh, um, more than 20 years ago. So um, in 2020, as a result of, um, let's say, uh, in state and territory governments and those, um, those sitting um, a few tiers below the, the ministerial level in the public service, not being able to um, bite the bullet on this issue um, and make a decision about it, an independent panel was appointed to, um, to, to, to re-look at all of the information and to make some recommendations. And that panel um, has indicated support for a phase out of battery cages. And here we are in 2020, still no decision. Um, the draft standards are sitting with state and territory ministers. No one is in a hurry to, um, to, uh, to sort of take that next step and actually um, commit to a phase out and um, at this stage the um, the egg industry would like if there was a date for that to be um, 2046 2046 to phase out battery cages so if there's one um, example of why um, I might have become a bit frustrated about the the, the way in which standards and guidelines are um, developed in Australia, this is probably the one that um, really stands out. Seven years and still no decision. And during that time, um, around 70 million hens will have been forced to live in battery cages because of the um, lack of decision making. So let's go to another issue um, that also was one of the ones that I first started working on when I um, I started with RSPC Australia and that's live sheep exports. Again, I, I, I wrote two reports in the first two years. I was here and the second one was on uh, the regulation of the, of the live sheep trade. And this issue, um, this issue was really uh, came again into the media in, in, uh, fairly early on in my career with RSPC Australia in 2003 when the Cormo Express incident happened where 6,000 sheep died after they were rejected by Saudi Arabia. It all died in the, in the weeks following that rejection on board the Cormo Express. Um, there's always been this strong correlation between uh, media exposés and, um, and significant shifts and change in regulation. Um, in live export as well as other areas. And um, as a result of the Cormo Express, uh, there were mandatory standards that were introduced for um, live export vessels. So they were around, around the selection and standards on board um, those vessels. In 2018, a similar, um, well, uh, similar, but, but um, potentially even more horrific because people finally saw footage of what it looked like on a live sheep export vessel. Um, and um, the, the fact that you had significant numbers of animals dying on board a single vessel, um, but nobody had ever seen it before. So we, we talked about these numbers for years, but what 60 Minutes did in, in 2018 was show that to the Australian public. That's the thing that made the difference in terms of um, governments actually being forced to act on the evidence that had been around for a long time, but just wasn't in visual um, graphic form. So as a result of the um, exposure of the, of the Awasi Express voyages, um, another set of, of changes happened, um, actually started to look at um, increasing space allowances for sheep on board live export vessels, which was something that I had personally been arguing for for a very long time. Um, very well, good evidence to show that that should have happened, um, but commercial pressures against it. Um, but the 
key thing that happened was was banning the northern summer hemisphere trade so no exports from june to mid september um, in the following year and um what that has mirrored or or sorry what that has um has increased is this gradual end to a gradual uh, reduction in the number of of sheep that are being exported from australia so the in the last year where numbers are available it was um half a million sheep down from you know over six million um in the in the in the periods where i first started working on this issue but it could rise again without regulation to phase out live sheep exports. Um, there's a great deal of pressure from the industry to, to get the Saudi market back on board, and that would significantly increase the trade again were that allowed to happen. Um, so it's going headed in the right direction, but it's not there yet. Um, so that's um, there's two examples of, of where progress has been made uh, um, with live sheep exports, but it's it's fiddling at the edges, if you like, in terms of um, the where an issue really should have come to an end, but we're still working on standards rather than um, phasing out of, of unacceptable practices. Um, so why you know, what can we do to try and um, shift from that to take a new approach to looking at these significant animal welfare problems um i mentioned i gave a talk back in 2008 this was at the first australian animal welfare strategy international conference it was my first keynote talk and um i put up this slide that asked the question about why progress in animal welfare was so slow um, and it showed this snail slowly moving across the screen. I think at that point, uh, the audience um, fell into two camps. And there were certainly a lot of people in that audience that were very, um, very understanding of, of that level of frustration and, and slowness of pace um, of animal, of change in animal welfare. But it took me um, probably another 13 years to figure out what, um, what I could do to um, look at a new approach. Um, and over that time, I've been thinking a lot about how could the animal welfare sector be more effective and have more impact in terms of um, progressing change for animal welfare. Because we can't rely on media exposés all the time to 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 just um, jump the the progress forward, uh, we need to understand um, ways of having a, a high level of impact on progress in animal welfare. And and where um, where that's landed is looking at tackling the system itself. So looking at ways to reform the way we create laws and policies for animal welfare in Australia, and that's the reason that. Um, the animal, the alliance, the Australian Alliance for Animals. I should remember the name of my own organisation. Um, that's why the alliance was created. the 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 point of the Alliance for Animals is to try and change that system by creating a more balanced and independent governance structure for animal welfare in Australia, one that better represents and safeguards the interests of animals. So yes, and the Alliance itself is um, an organization of three people. I'll show you who they are in a minute. Um, but we are uh, supported by um, six core member organizations. That's World Animal Protection, Compassion in World Farming, Animals Australia, Voiceless, Humane Society International, and Four Paws. But we also work with any other like-minded animal welfare organizations on specific issues and specific campaigns. Um, so um, on the issue of live export, for example, we've just we, we have brought together um, all the all the um, animal welfare organizations in Australia that work on that issue um, to share information and to talk about strategy and the approach that we'll take to live sheep exports over the, the current government term. And I'll come to that in a moment. So there's three of us in the Alliance. Um, I've got 
the, the, the joy of working with two lawyers. So um, Jed Goodfellow and Meg Good and my two colleagues, um, they're both animal welfare lawyers, PhDs in, in animal welfare law. Um, and um, we've, we work remotely. Um, I'm in Canberra and, the, and Meg and Jed are in, um, in Sydney. And we came together um, and we have a focus on three programs um, to, to have, have this aim of, of creating systemic change in policy making um, for animal welfare. Um, and their reform, accountability and representation. And this, the, the key um, aspect to, to this work is really about reform, about redesigning the policy frameworks in Australia so that they can work for animals and for the interests of animals. And one of the key, um, the key things um, there is that the key reforms is to um, create an independent National Animal Welfare Commission. That's something that the Productivity Commission recommended in its uh, report on agriculture in 2018. And um, it's really crucial in terms of, um, of, of dealing with this system that we have with standards and guidelines, um, where, we've, where we've got a, a seven year process that has resulted in, in no significant change. Um, if we had a, an independent office in, or commission for animal welfare that ran the process for standard setting um, and ran that in an independent way um, that took account of contemporary science and community expectations, then um, that would solve many of the problems that are created by the current standard setting system. We're also advocating for the independence of, of ministers for animal welfare. So um, instead of animal welfare sitting within the agriculture portfolio where, um, where public servants and ministers both have the problem of promoting agricultural industries as well as regulating them, we need to um, actually have animal welfare sitting outside of that nexus so that the conflict of interest between those two is not um, influencing animal welfare policy and animal welfare standard setting. Um, and that those two things, um, along with, with sufficient funding, would um, help create that fair and consistent process for creating animal welfare standards nationally. So that's what an independent office of animal welfare is all about. The other program that we're, 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 we're using to help support those reforms is, is really about increased transparency in animal welfare policy making. So making governments more accountable, encouraging the publication of information about animal welfare, encouraging um, more transparency about, about standard setting processes, and just creating a more, more, more balanced approach to the way in which animal welfare policy is set by exposing where there are issues um, similar to what I've talked about in terms of the way in which poultry standards have been have been um, developed over time. And finally, uh, representation. This is really about bringing the sector together and making sure that they um, or helping to uh, unify the way in which the animal welfare community works on on specific uh, on some specific issues, but more on the reform um, at the government level and really strengthening that rep representation. We feel that we can work together and be a, a stronger voice for animals because of that. Um, and, and that also will build the capacity for that political representation as well. And I'm just going to talk very briefly um, before I finish about what our first main piece of work has been, because it's um, it's probably uh, in a nutshell explains um, why this approach um, uh, can has the potential to be successful. So during the federal election campaign, which was a bit of a rush because we'd only launched in mid-March, so we haven't been around that long. Um, but we already knew what you know what our reform agenda was, um, and we also knew there was an opportunity to um, really nail down um, the level of support for a phase out of live sheep exports in in as a federal government issue, and and get that in front of um, policymakers um, and potential candidates. So um, we we decided we'd put out a scorecard. Um, a, 
for during the election and really target a number of marginal seats with those scorecards. So you could look at what the, the independent teal candidates were going to do. Um, and and, and um, the key uh, aim of that campaign was to actually publicize what the different um, animal welfare policies of those major parties and independent candidates would be across the uh, four different reform areas. Um, and key to that, of course, or, or the, the main point of that was to increase the likelihood of those reforms being implemented by the incoming government. So this is what our scorecard looked like. Um, this is what we came up with. Um, and um, the so and this was promoted in in 20 different marginal electorates and and nationally as well and what what happened as a result of that well the whole process of putting together the scorecard meant that we were able to get 16 parties and multiple candidates to actually provide their positions on animal welfare policy and particularly on those on those specific policy asks and one of the key things that came out of that was the um, Labour Party committed full or partial support for all of the four policy asks, including supporting a phase out of live sheep exports. And that similarly, um, the independent candidates, nine out of 10 of them supported a phase out of live sheep exports and um, 14 of 20 um, have supported a National Animal Welfare Commission. So those are commitments that they made prior to the election and therefore their commitments that can be um, lent on in the current government term. So without that campaign, we think it's unlikely that the Labour Party would have made any public announcements on animal welfare ahead of the election. And it puts us in a really good position to be able to promote and, and hold them to those commitments um, in the current term of government. I've spent too long talking um, I hope that there is still a little bit of time for questions, but um, that's um, coming out of that, coming out of the election, seeing seeing the position that we're now in um, with the, the idea that we could actually see finally an end to the live sheep export trade. It's something that the, the current government um, and the minister, the new minister for Ag agriculture has been very firm on in terms of sticking to the commitment that we're was made provide, um, prior to the election. Um, it's making me very hopeful for the future. I think um, the, the, the aim of starting a new organization and um, speaking, um, being able to, to speak on behalf of a whole range of, of groups um, and have that backing when we are talking to government um, is means that I think going forward, we, we can look forward to a, a stronger, more unified animal welfare sector in Australia. And that's a good thing for the interests of animals. Um, what we obviously are hoping to do is to achieve that uh, structural reform in the way that animal welfare is dealt with by government. Um, I, I'm very hopeful that we will have a better process. It would, hard, would be hard for it to be worse a better process for um, developing evidence-based animal welfare standards, which do reflect contemporary science and public expectations. Um, I'm also hopeful that there will be more active support for the interests of animals from the scientific and veterinary community. I think this is an area, um, and I, the people that I'm talking to at the moment um, across the sector are I think they're feeling energized about this, but um, vets and animal welfare scientists need to speak out about animal welfare and separating out that influence of industry from many of the process that we, processes that we have, I think will enable that. And a crucial aspect also is trying to separate out um, funding for animal welfare science from um, industry, complete industry um, in influence as well. Um, and in terms of issues, a legislated phase out of live sheep exports and I hope a phase out of battery cages are things that I, I'm, I am hopeful will happen in the very foreseeable future. So thank you. Um, I hope that's been a bit of a hectic journey through a few of the... <laughs> The key things in 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 my work, um, and I particularly like to thank 
um, the, the teams at RSPC Australia that I've worked with over the last 25 years, and of course, the, my new team at the Alliance for Animals. Thank you, Bida. And um, I think we have quite a few um, questions. Um, anyone, uh, feel free to raise your hand, so to speak, and directly ask Bida. Um, in the meantime, I will I will read out some of the questions here. Give me a minute. Um, Juliana is asking, how did the information behind the ABC article about egg farmers colluding with governments come to light? Do you need a whistleblower in any animal industry? Um, great question. Um, so this is where freedom of information requests are crucial to, um, to exposing decision making um, behind the scenes. So that's, that's how that information information came out so freedom of information um around the process that was that was taking place so that's part of what um can be quite frustrating if you're sitting in a committee but you can't talk about that but um all government committee processes have um should be available and transparent in terms of um the 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 way in which those um the the decision making making processes occur and that's been one of the problems that we've had is behind the scenes um and op the opacity of those decision making processes um and i i I'd, I'd um point to new zealand as an example of uh, of where animal welfare standard setting is very is well a lot more transparent and the way in which um, information is considered is, is even spelt out in terms of you know the balancing of information and different stakeholder views is is much more clear. Um, whereas in Australia we seem to be making it up as we go along half the time. Marsha, do you want to unmute and ask? And also, I have a question. Hello. Hello. Yes. Fire away. I can hear you. Um, thanks, Peter. I'm not sure that Panos can, and he's uh, quite close to me, actually, in the physical <laughs> sense. Um, Bitter, um, what uh, do or should we use as the definition of an animal and why? Oh, well, yes, that's a very good question. And that's um, changing all the time, I think. Um, I mean, this is all about sentience, um, and and it's it's pretty amazing that we do have different definitions of an animal when it comes to animal welfare legislation in different states in Australia. So, in some states, fish are still not regarded as animals; still don't have the same um, level of protection. Um, so, any animal that is capable of um, of suffering um, should be protected under the basic animal welfare legislation that is all about protection from harm and protection from cruelty. Um, but yeah, it, it comes down to sentience and and, and there's a, a, a huge body of work that's, um, you know, really, it's a really interesting field now in terms of thinking about um, the level of the potential sentience of invertebrates and, and which invertebrates may be sentient. Um, and and understanding um, what that means in terms of of yeah capacity to um, experience pain, suffering, and distress. Uh, Marshall, um, do you have a second question, or is it? Um... <laughs> uh, sorry, Panos. No, Marshall didn't put his hand down. However, you do that, <laughs> I'll just lower it. There you go. No worries. Thank you. Uh, we have a couple more. Uh, actually, I, I had one too, but uh, I'll, let, I'll read the other ones first. Um, so uh, we have uh, Aaron provided some uh, links to uh, the, the groups you mentioned. Uh, Anna three, uh, is asking away from the two. Change advocacy for animal welfare in Australia. I think you you sort of replied or mentioned. Yeah, no, I, I can 
talk a bit about that because I see there's another question about Animal Justice Party. Um, yeah. And um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah. sorry. I was just going to read it. If oh yes, I can. I'll, I'll, I can see. So the, another okay. question is: Do you think the Animal Justice Party state-based MPs are helping to bring more attention to animal welfare? Would they be in favour of your three main targets? So, um, quick uh, answer to the um, the last part of that question is that Animal Justice Party supported all of the reforms that the Alliance for Animals put forward in the our, our scorecard, as did the Greens. They were the the only two parties that already had public statements on those issues, um, but others um, joined them. Um, I think that the AJP has done a lot to raise um, the uh, raise animal welfare as an issue within um, those state parliaments where they have members. So that's in, in New South Wales and Victoria. Um, in New South Wales in particular, they've um, they've set up a number of different parliamentary committees that have enabled discussion about issues and and the uh, production of information and evidence that is now on the public record on those issues such as dolphins in captivity and uh, battery cages um, animals in research um, so those have been really important i think in terms of of yeah the the animal welfare debate um, I think single issue parties like the Animal Justice Party have that role, but but that's not going to change the system um, fundamentally. Uh, two party. So the the uh, the other question is about move away from two party systems. Will that change advocacy? It will if those if independents are interested in animal welfare and and the teal independents um, invariably are, and that's that was reflected in their responses to our scorecard. Uh, I think the, the the fact that there are women <laughs> has had an influence on that, um, but they're reflecting community expectations. They're very very much reflecting, uh, and that's where the 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 movement for those independence has come um, is about reflecting their the the, um, the views of their constituents. Um, whether or not I, I think having the, that pressure um, on the major parties will will have an effect on animal welfare, but we'll see how that shapes up in this in this current term of government. Bina, can I ask you something relating to that or expanding on that? Do you think that these key reforms that were suggested by the alliance uh, are vote turners, so to speak? Um. I think, um, did you say vote turners? Is that vote turners? Yeah. Yes. I mean, yeah. it's, you know, as opposed to um, having a position, having a position and uh, publicizing a position pre election is um, commitment enough. I'm, ju I'm just thinking about uh, the effect on the yes. election result potentially. I, yeah. Look, I think, I think um, in terms of, uh, the way people think about about animal welfare, probably realistically, um, it's not the number one issue on most people's minds when they're going to to polling. It's it, it's probably. I mean, I'm I've devoted my career to it, but I've got a whole raft of other things I'm thinking about when I go and vote. Yep. But it is an it it's certainly a factor. And so um, when you weigh all of those things up. It may not change who I'm going to put number one on my ballot paper, but it's it's going to change a number of other things that I'm going to be looking at in terms of, you know, when when you're looking at the Senate or an upper house in a, in a state election. Um, so I think it it is it becoming more and more important. Um, but you're going to look at it across, you know, alongside all those other issues that that people are considering when they vote. Um, it's if when people are undecided it could become a more significant issue. If you're looking at it as a sort of flagship um, issue for, well, what does, you know, I'm not sure about this independent, what do they think about animal welfare? It, it, it may help you make up your mind. So, but it's going to be one of many different factors. Yeah, it also puts things on the agenda, I guess. So that's the main thing, right? I think James has uh, a question. Yeah, th thanks, Panos. Uh, thanks, Peter, that was really good. Um, you made a, a, a lot of comments around the, the science and the evidence that informs the advocacy. What happens if future research 
and the evidence then doesn't support the advocacy? Do you change the position or do you, how, how do you deal with that? Because I mean, from a research point of view, that's pretty easy, but we're not actually going out advocating around the research. Do you know what I mean? Yes. Yeah. Look, I think when it comes to making decisions about what issues you're going to choose to go to, to do a full on advocacy campaign, they're not issues where the science is going to change. Um, you know, so you're looking at things where um, the, the evidence has been around for a long time on those two issues. Uh, you might the science might help you do something better. But if the fundamental proposition is that you shouldn't be doing it at all, the science is going, isn't going to change that. Um, however, um, there's a, so many different issues where the science is evolving. Um, and yes, that's exactly when new science will come in and, and um, should influence policy and should influence the direction of what animal welfare organisations are doing if they want to claim to be evidence-based. Um, Usually that works in a positive way, though. So, for example, pain relief. You know, when I first started working in in looking at painful husbandry procedures, there were very few uh, pain relief agents available for, you know, farm-based livestock. They just weren't there. Whereas if you walked into a small animal veterinary practice, you would have a range of different things that you could use on um, dogs and cats. And that's different now. Um, it's not that um, we we actually understand that dogs and cats um or sorry that that um you know sheep and cattle feel pain anymore any you no know, it's not we've suddenly discovered that they feel pain it's just that there are um those products are now available and the and the research has been done the and why has that happened because people have talked about pain and the need for pain relief um so the practical solutions to dealing with some of those um different husbandry procedures that are painful that advice has changed over time and so has the advocacy around it. So I think that that's probably a, um, certainly you have to be receptive to, to where science is going. And of course, you know, it, we've got also now we've got more, uh, probably more complex interactions between different areas like climate change. What does that mean in terms of uh, the way in which we 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 look at animal production does that mean that some types of intensive farming are going to be better for the environment? But what does that mean for animal welfare? All of those things need to be re reflective and, and adaptive to emerging science. I think we have one more question in, in the interest of time. If we can, um, I guess, uh, um, close with that one from Julie. And I'm not sure if you can. If you can see the question um, um, in, the no. chat, in the chat function. Oh, yes. So uh, Julie is asking about, um, do I have any thoughts on what it will take to get a national horse traceability register happening? Um, and do I see a revisit to lapsed national standards and guidelines for horses coming up the, under the new proposed commission? So I, I do, um, just on the second part of that question, um, I understand that prior to the election, standards and guidelines for horses were, were um, being considered as being added to the list of um, standards and guidelines that are on the Animal Welfare Task Group's agenda. Um, so um, we'll just watch that space uh, now that the, um, the, the new government has committed to more funding. So it has committed to, to a re revamping of the animal welfare strategy and, and funding that hopefully will enable more than one standard and guideline process to happen at once. The National Horse Traceability Register, um, I don't know what it will take um, to get that happening. Um, I think that is a process that has really gone off uh, off very much off track um and uh but i hope that you know yes a, 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 a new change in direction federally will will hopefully relook at that um i would i think it's a, a very important thing that needs to happen um and i don't know why the current process isn't um isn't making progress as it should thank you Rita. i think we if we had three more hours, I'm sure there will be tons more questions. But uh, in the interest of time, I think we will have to leave it there. So thank you again so much for, for this seminar and for accepting my invitation.
And uh, I think we'll, we'll leave it there for now. Thanks, Panas. It's been a pleasure. And um, yes, thank you to everybody who, who came along to listen. Thanks so much.